Greetings friends of Dina Rose Ministries. If you are interested in having Dina come and speak at any of your church or organizational events, please contact us at srose at dinarose.com. We're going to dig in tonight, Steve. I totally forgot to give you the scripture verses. Uh, Revelations chapter 2 is where we're going. Are the revelation. You see how tempting that is to put the S in there? Whenever we used to do junior Bible quiz with the kids here at the church, do you know that the kids would get marked off in their competitions if they said revelations instead of revelation? There's not multiple revelations. It's one revelation. <laughs> that was given to the Apostle John on the Isle of, of Patmos. But I'm telling you, it is hard sometimes to not say revelations. All right, but we're going to the second book of the Revelation. I had actually uh, began preparing a completely different message for tonight. And I got up this morning to put the finishing touches on it and just to make sure all of my notes were in order and the Lord just totally changed directions. And uh, I walked out into the kitchen and I told Chris and I says, well, I'm going in a whole different direction. And she went, oh, goody. <laughs> so this is just what the Lord laid on my heart today. And he just, he changed the direction and where I was going. But I think it's going to speak volumes to us about where God's attention is right now in these last days that we're in. I don't think that that's any secret that we are in the last of the last days. And so much Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and there's really not anything left to happen except for the rapture of the church before that great and dreadful day of the judgment of the Lord through the great tribulation. So what is God saying to his church during this time? Revelation chapter 2 starting at verse number 1, Steve. John writes, this is the words of Jesus in the revelation that he had. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, I want you to write these things. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now we're going to come back to Ephesus in a few minutes, but we're going to go ahead and finish reading all seven letters because God had a message to the church in that time, but it is a dual application for us now. And it, to me, it is not coincidental that John wrote all of these things just before he revealed the great revelation of the tribulation that will be coming to the earth. God was giving his church, is giving his church one more time to repent. All right, now as we work through these letters, keep in mind, this was written to believers. It was written to the pastors of these churches. Verse number eight, and to the angel, which just simply means messenger or pastor, of the church in Smyrna, write, these things says the first and the last, he who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. 
And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now if you go back to the church at Ephesus, Jesus commended them because they hated the work of the Nicolaitans, which we'll talk about in a minute. But now at this church, he's condemning them because they embraced the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Verse 16, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Verse number 18. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are even more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now that sounds closely similar to what he just condemned the other church for, didn't it? Yeah. Verse 21, and I gave her to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have until I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things say he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, and before his angels, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 7, chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, 
Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and garments and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Seven churches, seven letters, a warning, a final message from Jesus, a last final chance to repent. And as I was preparing for tonight and getting ready for this message, I felt like that's what he was saying to me all over again. That things are winding down and they're winding down quickly. We have watched that. It could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, but it's sure a lot sooner than it was yesterday or last year and God is saying to the church his church at large listen you've got one more chance to get it right this great outpouring that we're believing for the Joel 2 revival that we believe is coming and I believe has already started it's already begun in the midst of persecution every great revival that has ever broken out has broken out in the midst of persecution but with that revival is going to come the need to have to batten down those hatches and prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord. It is going to require a repentance on our part. These were believers. These letters were written to churches and to believers who had drifted just a little bit off. Yet most of them didn't even know it. He says, you have a reputation in your community of being alive but you're really dead. I've seen your patience, your perseverance. I've seen all those good works. I know that you're wealthy and you seem to be prospering in need of nothing, but you don't even understand that you are wretched, you are poor. I mean, those words, let's read that part again. Verse 17 of chapter three, Steve. He says, you do not even know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus did not pull punches when he confronted people. And we are really in a day and an hour where we have got to be over our political correctness and worrying about how we confront people in their sin. Because Jesus is coming. He is coming soon. He's coming for a bride that is without spot, that is without wrinkle, who has prepared herself for his return. And the niceties just aren't going to cut it anymore. It is the political correctness and the niceties that we have fallen prey to for about the last 30 years that has gotten the church to where she is. And how come during 2020, she really was not much of a force to be reckoned with? I think that we have seen through this whole pandemic and throughout 2020 into 2021 
that aside from a handful of pastors who were willing to even be jailed for their faith, we have seen some who were arrested and who were taken to jail for their faith. Aside from those handful and a handful of worshipers who were willing to get out on the streets and worship God no matter what they were going to face, no matter what harm may have come their way, except for those handful of people, the church pretty much had no influence throughout 2020. And that is a really sad story. And if this is any indication of what is to come in the great tribulation, the, the practice run of the Antichrist spirit, whatever you want to call it, that we have been through in this time, the church failed. But God has got a message for the church that one more time, I'm going to speak to you directly because you are my beloved. And I am going to tell you the good things that you have done. He has seen our works. He has seen our evangelistic efforts. He has seen the times that we have fed the needy, that we have fed the poor, that we have taken care of those who were in prisons, that we have taken care of the orphans. God has seen it all. But what is it that he may have against us that he has given us a final opportunity to repent of? When we look at those seven churches... Only two out of the seven were commended by the Lord and had prepared themselves for the time that they were in. Only two. Two out of seven. The other five churches received a strong rebuke from the Lord, although they had an outward facade of religion. The Bible says that there is a point that we can come to where we hold a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Meaning, we go to church, we may read our Bible, we say we're a Christian, we never miss when the doors of the church are open and all the exterior looks good. But are we really walking in a true love affair, passionate relationship with Jesus? Because those were the two churches who received his commendation. The ones who were still passionate about their relationship with him. And out of that relationship flowed the works of ministry. The other five were condemned because of the loss of their first love, which we're going to dig into a little bit deeper. They also were condemned because immorality and idolatry had crept in and they did nothing about it. They tolerated it. The fourth church was also condemned because they tolerated those who brought in immorality and idolatry. Some in the church had not fallen into the idolatry or the immorality, but they approved of those who did. And even if you just approve and don't confront, but you allow it in your midst, God said, I have this against you. They were also condemned for being dead. James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 is all about faith combined with works. He says, you show me your faith and I'll show you my works because faith without works is dead. It is not good enough to go to church, to sing our songs, to say our nighttime prayers, if there are no works behind what we profess to believe. If we just go to church and we punch our little time clock on Sundays because, you know, we got to put in our time on Sunday morning because most of those timekeepers don't come on Sunday night. I'm going to punch my time clock on Sunday morning because I am a Christian. I've got to give a little nod to Christ. But then you go about your week, the rest of the week, and there are no works that are associated with your faith, then your faith is dead. You are no better off than the church that he was confronting. This church was known to have a reputation of being alive. Oh, my goodness, you should go down there and visit First Church on the Corner because, oh, their worship is amazing. They hoop and they holler. They even had a Jericho march around that building. It's amazing down there. But what are they doing? What are they doing for their community? When is the last time they reached out to the poor, the needies, the widows, the orphans? When's the last time that they visited those who were in jail? You know, Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. 
You cannot profess to have faith in Jesus and to be a believer in Yahweh if there are no works in your life to back it up. The Bible is super, super clear on that. But that is exactly what the church had fallen into. The reputation was that they were alive, probably Pentecostal, hooping, hollering, shouting, dancing all around the place. But whenever God looked at them, he said, you're dead. Because there is not even any works, no evidence of the spirit being quickened in your heart that compels you to get out and do the real work of ministry. And then the last church that received a condemnation from the Lord was the one that was lukewarm, without any passion, being indifferent to the doctrine that they held so close. I want to take you back to the church in Ephesus, the first church and the third church. The Nicolaitans are mentioned there. In the first church, God says, you've done all these wonderful things. You love me. I know you love me. And you even have denounced the work of the Nicolaitans. Now, two letters over, we see that that church had embraced the philosophy. Nicholas was a man who we see in the book of Acts. He got saved during the great Pentecostal revival of the Acts of the Apostle. He came to know the Lord, but he had fallen into Gnosticism and began to walk away from the faith. During that time, and especially in the city of Ephesus where the Nicolaitans were, were pretty well known to be, there was the temple to the goddess Diana. Some of you may know her as Artemis. She was the goddess of love and fertility. There were sexual acts that were done in the temple of Diana and temple prostitutes that were there. And because Nicholas and those who followed his beliefs and his teachings had started to veer away from the real true faith of the word, they began to embrace what was happening in their culture. There also was a, a sacrifice that they would have to the goddess and they would take the meat and they would eat of the meat because they believed that it brought them good luck or blessing from the goddess. The Christians in that region were under heavy persecution and were even told, if you don't eat of this and partake of this, you will be jailed. You're going to jail. Kind of sounds a little bit like what we're facing in 2021 right now, doesn't it? Do this or you're going to jail. Don't do that or you're going to jail. There was so much pressure that was put on the believers in this area that some of them, we see some of them, had fallen prey to that and they were like, okay, well, we'll go to church on Sunday. We're just going to say they didn't, they didn't necessarily do church the same way we do church. By this point, they were worshiping on Sundays in celebration of the risen Savior. But we're going to go to church and we're going to give our nod to Christianity because we really do believe what Jesus did and the finished work of the cross. But... We can't really live according to the Bible because if we do, we're going to be up under heavy persecution. We might even go to jail. So they would visit the temple of Diana during the week and they would participate in these activities and then come into church on Sundays wanting to worship as though none of that had happened. And God said, listen, if you think that you are connected to me in a right way that you're going to enter my kingdom, you need to think again. And I am exposing that to you because I love you enough to give you a chance to repent and to turn from that wickedness. Now, the church in Ephesus had denounced the Nicolaitans. They would never embraced that. They did not bring idolatry into the church. They did not bring immorality into the church. They still held fast to the teachings of the apostles to keep things upright and holy before God. But God still had something very major that he held against them. Let's go back and look to see what that said. He says in verse number four of chapter two, Nevertheless, this is what I have against you, that you have left your first love. My personal opinion is that it probably was only a matter of time, honestly, if God had not sent this letter through the pen of the Apostle John. 
If he had not confronted the church of that time, just as now, it probably wouldn't have been much longer that this church would have allowed the Nicolaitan influence inside as well. We see that five out of the seven had already allowed all these things right inside the doorstep. And it starts when we lose that first love. When we lose our passion, or maybe even never had it, some people come to the Lord. I was listening yesterday to a lady who, uh, I forget her name now, but she ministers across the country. And she was kind of giving a little bit of her testimony. And she was talking about as a teenager how she went to a Billy Graham crusade. And how it was the first time that she had ever heard anybody say, just because you quote a sinner's prayer doesn't mean you're really saved. She said at the moment that he said that, like something just clicked for her and it made sense to her because a few years prior to that in her church, someone had said, if you want to receive the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. So she did sit in her pew. She, she knew Jesus. She really did want to love him. The sermon convicted her and she wanted to come in relationship with him. So she repeated the prayer and she truly meant it in her heart. But nothing seemed to change for her. She went home and she was still depressed. Her actions didn't change. Her attitude didn't change. There was no discipline in her life as far as becoming a true disciple of the way. But she could never figure out why, you know, but I prayed that prayer, so I, I'm not understanding. Then she goes to that crusade and she hears him say, it's not because you said the prayer. But it's because you come to truly know him, to accept him in your life as your Lord and as your Savior, that you dig into his word to get to learn who he is. That's when you truly know that you have been saved. I think we do people a big injustice, you know, nothing wrong with leading people in a sinner's prayer. And sure, we hope it sticks, as they say. But there is so much more to that. So. You could be sitting in this room, you may be even watching online, that you haven't lost passion because you never really had passion. What is the word passion defined as? Dictionary.com defines it this way. A powerful and compelling emotion. When you have passion for something or someone, it shows. You can't keep it hidden, all right? You find your new favorite chocolate, girl, you telling everybody about it, and everybody knows you're pretty passionate about that chocolate. You start a new diet, and things are happening for you, and everybody's going to know all about your keto because you're passionate about it. Kristen brought up a subject to me last night at the dinner table, and she was saying, Mom, what do you think about this particular thing? And so I got to talking and I was just like, you know, like preaching a three point sermon right there. What? <laughs> I, was, I was giving her like all the examples and this and this and this. And I said, I know I probably sound mad right now. I don't mean to come across that way, baby. I am just so passionate about this subject. When you are passionate about something, people are going to know it. And don't come at me with, but it's just my personality. I'm not a passionate person. We were talking about this, I think it was last week, maybe on the way home from church, or it was sometime, maybe it was Sunday morning on the way to church last week. We got to talking because I had heard uh, an interview with a well-known worship leader in our, in our fellowship, and she was talking about all the different aspects and the points of worship, you know, and everything. And I told Kristen, I said, there has to be a passion inside of you that just compels you. And I said, these people that want to respond and say, but I don't clap in church because I'm not expressive. I'm just not an expressive person. Honey, I have sat with you at ball games. You're pretty expressive to those referees. I have gone to movies with you and seen you get excited about it. I mean, you're clapping and cheering on people but like we'll be watching Wind Calls the Heart. And something will happen and Chris and I are both at, to add the TV. Don't choose him. Don't choose him. Like she can really hear us, you know. We are all expressive about some things. Even the most reserved person that you know. You can think into your family, your friends, your neighborhood, whatever. Even the most reserved person that you know will come alive whenever it is finally 
a subject, a sport, an event, something that really charges their battery and gets their mojo going. They come alive. So when you sit in a church service and there's no expression from you, there's no worship that comes forward. And, and I'm sorry. I know people say you can worship the Lord quietly. Just close your eyes and just worship in your own way. Worship in your heart. That's not the example in my Bible. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, people who came into a relationship where Jesus, with Jesus was very expressive in their worship. The Bible tells us to clap. The Bible tells us make a joyful noise. The Bible tells us to even lift our voice in shouts of praise. God commands that we worship even with our emotions. Most often it is our emotions that hold us back. We either feel unworthy, we don't feel good enough, we've got an argument with somebody, we feel like a hypocrite today. Whatever the reasons are that we're held back in worship is usually tied to an emotion. And I believe that that is why the Lord commanded worship through our emotions. Shout with a voice of triumph. Lift your holy hands. In the Old Testament, they had to give wave offerings and they had to give heave offerings. They had to give clap offerings because the way they expressed their worship had to come through in a physical way. And when you become truly passionate about the Father, that is going to show. You're not going to be able to hold it in. This church had lost their first love, which says to me that at some point in time, they had it. They had their first love. What exactly do we see when somebody is radically in love? We're going to touch on these four things super quickly because this is going to help you to know if you've lost that first love because obviously God is trying to get a message to his church. Time is winding down and he's like, listen, some of you guys have been doing everything right. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss. You're not watching witchcraft movies. Everything in your life seems to be lining up great. You're going to church, and man, I see it. You haven't accepted immorality. You haven't accepted idolatry. You have kept those Nicolaitans outside of your church. You haven't allowed them in, but you've lost your passion for me. You've lost the thing inside of you that drives you to serve me with everything you've got. And if you don't stop and repent... I'm not receiving you. And not only that, but it won't be long until all those compromises whittle their way into your life. Compromise always comes into our life at the moment we lose our passion. It is our passion and our love affair for our Savior that keeps us connected and closed off to the world. How do I know? Look at your relationship with your spouse. You are not tempted to adultery or fornication, fooling around, whatever temptation it comes to cheating with your spouse, as long as you are still radically, passionately in love with each other. But the moment in your relationship that the passion begins to die is when the compromises start coming in. And it is a work to keep passion stoked. It is the same way in our relationship with the Father. It doesn't just happen continually from now till Jesus comes that the passion level is going to be super high. It is something that we have to stoke and that we have to work on. Some of the ways that we know if we're passionate and if we still have that first love, think back with me. If you can think back if you've ever been in love, you had to be together. You just had to be together. I can remember, I'm going to tell on my little brother, if he happens to see this online, you have to forgive me, Ronnie, because the Bible says so. <laughs> but I can remember whenever he went off to college, he went off to Florida State University. My parents were still living in Interlochen at the time. That was about a three-hour drive. Every Friday, when he got out of that last class, he rushed to his car as fast as he could to drive those three hours home because his little girlfriend was still in town. And on Sundays, he got back in his car and headed back to school. And he did this, guys, every weekend because he loved her. He was passionate about her. He was going to do what it took to be with her. 
There was nothing going to stop him. Distance, time, rain, sleet, or snow. He was more faithful than the United States Post Office. You also give up opportunities at times. Whenever you're dating and you're all in love and you're just like, oh my goodness. Somebody comes to you and says, listen, I have got playoff tickets. It is round one of the playoffs. We've got... 50-yard line seats right down front. You can't beat it. Come on, man. You got to go. Mm, nah, I got to be with my girl, man. I got to be with my girl. You will even pass up opportunities to be with the one that you love. You're going to stay up late or get up super early because you know what? I got to talk to her before I go to sleep. I got to talk to him. I need to talk to him before I go to work because it just starts my day off right. I've just got to have the sound of his voice in my ear. When you're truly in love, when you are first in love and passionate about something, those are the things that you see evidenced in your life. My question is, when's the last time that you drove an insane distance to make sure you were in the presence of God? If you knew about getting to church, but there's a tree down in your, on your road, when is the last time that you said, listen, I'm going to call Uber. They can meet me on the other side of the tree. I'm going to drive to the tree. I'll leave my car here, but I am getting to the house of God. And don't come at me with knowing that, oh, it's online. I can stay home and I can worship. No, you can't. I went through the same pandemic you did. For about six weeks, this church was closed to all of us, myself included. I turned on the, the sermons. I turned on, matter of fact, not just dad every time he would preach a sermon, but I was turning on all the churches. You know, he would get done at 12. The church in Arizona was coming on at 12. And I mean, it was just like church all day long because you were so desperate to feel God's presence. But that was not good enough for me. When you are madly, passionately in love with that boy or that girl, I am sorry, but Zoom ain't cutting it. You are going to find a way to be in the presence of your lover. You are going to find a way of that intimate connection. Because I don't care who you are. I don't care how good of a camera you have. I don't care what the sound system sounds like. There is no comparison to watching church online as there is to being in the house of God where his manifest glory shows up in the combined presence of his people. He is always there in the corporate assembly. And if you are staying home and you're not making the effort, you're not going through the distances and you're not giving up other opportunities. Well, somebody invited me out to dinner. Pass up those opportunity because you can come and dine at his table. If you are not making the effort to get into the presence of a holy God and doing what it takes to be where the glory is, then it is possible you have lost your first love. When we are madly, passionately in love with people, we want to serve them. You know, when you first get married, ladies, I don't know about you guys, but when Steve and I first got married, he would get up super early to go to work, and I'd get up to iron his clothes. I'd say, wake me up so I can fix your lunchbox, and I'd get up and I'd pack his lunch. While he was gone to work, I would make him dinner, and I would even roll out homemade dough to have those apple pies. You remember that? Apple pie is Steve's favorite dessert. If y'all ever want to bring him something, apple pie, right, Steve? And I would sit there and I'd work hard all day and I'd roll out homemade dough and everything because I was going to be the perfect little wife because I just loved him so much. Had his clothes clean, had the house clean. Matter of fact, I can remember the first time that I was really sick after we got married. Steve came home and the house hadn't been straightened up. The bed hadn't been made. There was still stuff out on the kitchen, I mean, on the uh, bathroom counter. And he looked around and he said, Dina? Where are you? Are you okay? And I said, no, not really. I feel terrible. And he says, well, I figured you must because the house wasn't straightened up today. Because when you're first madly, passionately in love, oh my gosh, you want to do everything for them. You know, the fellas open the doors for the girls, make sure they put their coat on the puddles for them to walk through and not get mud in their sandals. The more time goes and the more comfortable you get with each other, it's like, you want dinner? <laughs> You know where the stove and the pot is. And I will buy you Mrs. Smith's, right? <laughs> Those could be signs. 
if we have stopped wanting to serve in the church, if we've stopped wanting to serve our community, if we have stopped wanting to give our best to make sure that people come into relationship with Jesus, then it is possible we have lost that first love. And one of the last things that we do whenever we are madly passionate about somebody is we talk about them. You show off their pictures, you brag on them, you want to tell everybody everything about what they've done, what their accomplishments are. Come on, every grandma or granddaddy in this room, you know, whenever you're around people, I got a picture this week from Miss Judy. She sent me a text and she's like, this is my granddaughter who plays soccer. And she's beautiful, by the way. She's absolutely gorgeous because we're so proud of them. Huh? State there you go. Stay tuned. We're so proud of them. You know, I brag on Kristen, I brag on Bob, I brag on Steve. And it's like whenever you are madly passionate about somebody, everybody knows it. If you start dating somebody and you don't want to talk about it, then maybe you really aren't passionate about them. And maybe, just maybe, you haven't caught that flame yet that's got your heart pitter-pattering. Because when the heart starts skipping a beat, you tell everybody about it. When is the last time that you shared your faith? When is the last time, whether it's through social media or whether it is a face-to-face -face contact, that you shared your faith? Oh, I live my faith. I figure if people want to know, they'll talk to me about it. Then you, then you don't have passion. You've lost your first love. Or maybe you never even knew what it was like to fall in love with him. Maybe you got an invite to a church, and maybe you can go ahead and slip to the piano. Maybe you got an invite to church with somebody. Maybe you just started coming for whatever the reason was that you found yourself in church, and you never really caught that passion for Jesus. Maybe he never really was that all-consuming fire in your life. The five churches that were in trouble, and I believe a, a dual reference for today, all allowed these compromises in because at some point they had lost their first love. I don't think that it's any coincidence that God started off with the letter to Ephesus because he told them in Ephesus, listen, you've lost your first love. You've got everything else. You are holding out the sin. You are walking in all the outward things. You're legalistic in a lot of those things because that's what it becomes at that point. It just becomes legalism. If you're only doing it because you feel compelled to do it because you've always been taught that this is what we do or this is what we don't do, it's legalism for you. Because when you are madly, passionately in love with Jesus, these things just naturally happen. Because you love him so much, you want to be in his presence. When's the last time that you got up super early or stayed up super late after everybody else went to bed so that you could get that last phone call connection with Jesus? All of these things that we can relate to a love affair with our spouse or our boyfriend or our girlfriend are the same ways that we can look at our relationship with God. He, he likened our relationship with him to a marriage relationship. We are the bride of Christ. Have we lost our passion? He wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said, listen, I'm going to grab you. Before it goes any further. Because these churches have already let it in. They've let Jezebel in. She's brought in her immorality. She's brought in the idolatry. They have let the philosophy of the Nicolaitans in. They have embraced the philosophy of Balaam. Who the whole thing with Balaam was that they enticed the young men of Israel with the prostitutes of the land. They have allowed the compromises in. But listen. You people in Ephesus. I am trying to catch you before your lack of love gets you that far. And I believe that that is the compelling message for the church in this hour. The last church that he wrote to, it was all about being lukewarm, which is exactly the place that we are when we lose that love. When we don't have that passion. It is that driving passion, that forceful emotion and desire for God that keeps us piping hot. And Jesus said, listen, I would rather you be stone cold. 
I would rather you just walk away from the faith altogether and be completely stone cold than to have a semblance of something, a semblance of something that is succulent to the appetite. And yet whenever I taste of my relationship with you, it makes me want to vomit because there is no heat. There is no passion. You are a facade, a fake, and a phony. You guys know how it is. If you've ever walked into your kitchen and there's like a plate that is set out on the, on the countertop and you're thinking, my goodness, dinner looks fantastic. And you take your knife and fork and cut into it and it's cold and nasty. What's the first thing you want to do? Spit it out. Because it looks so appetizing. But it was gross. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to say about me that my relationship with him is gross. I don't want him to think I got to spew you out. I, I just, I can't even stomach you. It, it makes me want to regurgitate because you're so fake and you're so phony and you've got all of these things lined up on the outside, but there is no passion in you. Your works have diminished. You're dead on the inside. You have begun to compromise and allowed idolatry and you have allowed other things to take first place in your life all because you lost that love. You guys stand with me. We're going to pray tonight. And especially for all of those who are watching online, I, you know, maybe you're watching online tonight because you have lost your first love. There are obviously reasons that people can't necessarily get to the house of God on occasion. There are times, there are times that life circumstances really do uh, demand your time. They demand your attention. And, you know, every time you miss church, that's not saying it's because you're cold and lost your first love. But when it begins to be a habitual thing, when you're okay with missing, when it becomes a habit and you say, I can just catch it online. I'll, I'll catch the replay. I'll just watch it later. Then you need to take an evaluation and ask yourself, have I lost my passion? Have I quit serving in the church? Have I quit getting up early, staying up late? Have I quit making that drive across town because it's so inconvenient? The Bible says to bring to him the sacrifice of praise. You know, it's not always so easy for me to get in my car and come down here either. I've got over an hour drive to get here. And trust me, there are many Sunday mornings that I would love to roll over back in bed and say, I'll catch it live at 10 o'clock. But passion compels me to be in the house of God. When 2020 was going on and we were closed for that first little bit of time because we just didn't know what all was happening in the world and what was going on with this virus, I could not wait. There was a burning passion in me to get back in the house of God with God's people. Yes, God can touch you in a living room. God can touch God touched Balaam on the road with a donkey. He can touch you anywhere. But if you will not get up to make the effort because you're just tired or whatever the reasons are, then you need to examine, have you possibly lost your first love? Because God is beckoning his church in this final hour. He is saying, listen, I want you to dig back in because following these letters to these churches, John the Apostle gave the great revelation of the coming tribulation. And Jesus was saying, listen, if this is happening and this is happening and this is happening, don't think that you're coming home to be with me. He said, let the churches hear what the Spirit is saying. Don't think that you're coming home to be with me. And he is trying to grab our attention in this final hour to reignite, to restoke that passion. When a fire begins to die out, you have to to stoke the flame a bonfire in your backyard or a fire in your fireplace takes work it takes a watchful eye to continue to burn and that is what we have to do we have to make ourselves get up early we have to make ourselves stay up late we have to make ourselves get to the house of god we have to make ourselves be about the work of the kingdom it is something that we must ignite in ourselves to make sure that our connection is there and we have a promise from the father that when we do he will meet us there 
God, I thank you so very much for your warning in Scripture. I thank you so much, God, that you loved the church enough and that you continue to love the church in 2021 enough that you are reminding us of this admonition in the Holy Scriptures. That you are captivating our attention and that you are saying, listen, I see all that you're doing. I see your worship services. I see your outreaches. I see all the wonderful things you're doing. But listen, you've lost your first love. You're doing it now out of habit. You're doing it because you're compelled to do it by other reasons. But you're not doing it because you're compelled in your love for me. Wake up. Stoke the flame before you get to a dangerous point where compromise comes in. God, I thank you that you love us enough to issue that warning tonight. And Lord, I pray it is my deepest hope and desire that everyone who is watching online or those who are in this room right now will take self-evaluation. God, that we would get real in our relationship with you and that we would evaluate where are we. Do those flames of passion need to be stoked? God, it takes a humility. It takes a desire. It takes pushing through the hindrances of the enemy. And God, I pray a special blessing on all of those who are falling within the hearing of this message. God, I pray a blessing that they would have that desire again. Or maybe even for the first time that they would get a vision of you on the cross and exactly what you did to pay the penalty of our sin that you left the splendor of heaven to live as human to live in our world to feel what we feel and to go through the the hardships of life that we face every day you did that because you wanted us to know that you relate to us. And yet your passion for us drove you to the cross. God, how could our passion for you drive us anywhere less? God, I pray that our passion would be ignited to the point that we are willing to give our lives if that's what it takes. God, that we are willing to face jail if that's what it takes. God, that we are willing to face ridicule, to face humiliation, to face persecution if that's what it takes. Because even that would not dare be enough to pay you back for what you did on Calvary. God, I pray that a passion would well up inside all those who are listening. God, a new hunger, create in us a new hunger and a new desire, oh God. issue all of y'all a challenge this week before we dismiss that I want you if it's possible choose one or the other you can either set your clock to get up early or after the house is quiet and everybody goes to bed you stay up late but I want your challenge this week to be a passionate pursuit you may not feel the passion right away you know, when a husband and wife and they their marriage gets in trouble and it's on the rocks and they're trying to they're trying to get back together, they may not feel it right away. But when you make that effort to reconnect, the passion will come. Because if you will make that effort on your part, I can promise you God's going to make the effort on his part. He is going to meet you there. And your time with him, your fellowship, your supplication with him is going to reignite the fires of passion. So that is the first step that I challenge all of you guys to take. Get up early or stay late. And start that intimate time with him. And it's not going to be long to where they wouldn't even be able to put enough boards on the doors to keep you out of God's house. Because you're going to be so passionate. You'll tear them down to get inside. Who's going to do it with me this week? Raise your hand if you're going to take the challenge. We're going to do it, Lord. Raise your hands for the blessing. God, I thank you so much for your people who were here tonight. And 
God, I thank you for those who have tuned in online, wherever they may be watching from. And God, I believe that there was power in this message because I believe that it was a message from heaven. And God, I pray this week, I just speak a blessing over each and every one of them that as they set this special time aside and as they dig in a little deeper, as they make a concerted effort to be with you again in a new way, that you're going to meet them there, God. And I pray that they will be blessed with a passion that they have never experienced before. God, that that passion is going to drive them into something new in these coming days. And that God is part of this last day's revival. They are going to do so many great things things for you. No matter their age, no matter how long they've been saved, God, that that passion is going to stir something on the inside of them that is going to drive them to servanthood of the cross. I pray that you go with them, that you bless their goings in, their coming out, that they will be the head and not the tail. And we will give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be blessed.